Last week, we were talking about the fact that life keeps oscillating. And uh, no matter how far we go in life, no matter how evolved we think we are and how much we've got certain things under our belt, life keeps moving up and down. And boy, I was just talking to a couple people today that are really going through it. Some, some really heavy-duty things in their lives. And that's the shape of it. That doesn't change. You know, life is always going to continue to hand us things that we have to deal with. Things that put us on the trough side of the oscillation. And then we know if we just keep breathing, if we just keep walking, then it's going to come back up again. We're going to get back. But it's, it's that doubt, I suppose, wondering when and how much and can I make it that makes it such a, such a difficult time. But the main thing is, is can we at least grasp the fact that this is the shape of life? Not expect something different. Not hope for something different. That's where we're going. And not only that, these oscillations, these downs and ups, you know, obviously they're created by circumstance and they're created by events, choices that you make and others make. But some of it is all internal. Some of it is just a matter of perception, us perceiving things in a certain way, regardless of circumstances that make them seem as if they're negative or something else is going on. And to that end, I wanted to read you a little bit. And how many times have you heard George Carlin quoted in church? <laughs> we, continue <laughs> we continue to push the envelope in here. We continue to do things you shouldn't do in church. But I got this, actually, Kathleen sent this to me several years ago, years ago. And I, I don't know how I came across it again. I guess I was doing some house cleaning in the computer. And this is just so perfect. I love how these things kind of come up just at the right time, you know. But this is George Carlin talking about aging. And he says, do you realize that the only time in our lives when we like to get old is when we're kids? If you're less than 10 years old, you're so excited about aging that you think in fractions. How old are you? I'm four and a half. You're never 36 and a half. You're four and a half going on five. That's the key. Now you get into your teens and now they can't hold you back. You jump to the next number or even a few ahead. How old are you? I'm going to be 16. You could be 13, but hey, you're going to be 16. And then the greatest day of your life, you become 21. Even the words sound like ceremony. You become 21. Yes. But then you turn 30. Ooh. <laughs> What happened there? Makes you sound like bad milk. He turned. We're going to have to throw him out. There's no fun now. You're just a sour dumpling. What's wrong? What changed? Right? You become 21. You turn 30. Then you're pushing 40. <laughs> Whoa, put on the brakes. It's all slipping away. Before you know it, you reach 50 and your dreams are gone. But wait, you make it to 60. <laughs> you didn't think you would. So, you become 21, you turn 30, push 40, reach 50, and make it to 60. You built up so much speed that you hit 70. <laughs> After that, it's a day-by-day -day thing. You hit Wednesday, right? <laughs> then you get into your 80s, and every day is a complete cycle. You hit lunch. <laughs> you turn 430. You reach bedtime. And it doesn't end there. Into the 90s, you start going backwards. I was just 92. <laughs> then a strange thing happens. If you make it over 100, you become a little kid again. I'm 100 and a half. <laughs> it's the same process. It's just aging. But we are going to look at it differently at different phases of our lives. We create the oscillation, don't we? By our internal perceptions and how we look at it how we look at these things, how we look at our moments, how we look at circumstances. We can take a perfectly good moment and turn it into a living heck if we want to, even if we don't want to. Things are happening underneath that we're not even aware of that are coloring our perceptions and our frustrated dreams, our frustrated outcomes, the things we think we haven't accomplished yet, all that headspace going out in all directions except right down into the roots of this moment are going to create all sorts of oscillations Self-perception, the way we see ourselves, the way we wish to see ourselves. And again, no matter how evolved you get, this isn't going to change. The oscillations are going to keep coming. But 
the more evolved you get. The more that you start to hone in, tune in to Jesus' way, at least the internal oscillations can start to level out. At least we're not going to be bringing more and more of this stuff to every one of these moments and coloring it in a way that it doesn't need to be colored. I was talking to a friend just, just uh, I think it was Friday, and we were talking along these lines, and his question was, does it ever get easier, you know, the, the way he's going through things? And I said, yeah, good news is it does. But you never stop doing it, quote unquote. You never stop balancing. You know, the best analogy I've got is a tightrope walker. We watch a tightrope walker and we're amazed that they can do what they do across that little cable, right? But we can walk across a room without even thinking about it. Go back and try to remember or watch a one-year-old trying to learn to walk and see how they wobble and how they fall and how many times as they try to get those muscles to coordinate. And now we walk across the room without even thinking about it. Yes, it gets easier. But your muscles are still going through every intricate balance that had to happen when you were one or one and a half, it's still happening now. It's just into muscle memory. It's something that we can do. The tightrope walker looks more amazing, but it's the same thing. They can walk across that wire as easily as we walk across the room. It gets easier, but make no mistake, every moment is conscious balancing. They're holding that bar, you know, that stabilizer, and they're constantly working with that. They're working with everything and every muscle. They're always balancing, but it gets easier. Life is like that. You will always be balancing. You always need to be conscious of this moment and where you are and what you're doing and what you're bringing to the table. But it gets easier. After a while, you'll be doing it without thinking as much about it. You know, That's what we're after. That's what we're trying to get to right now. And so this successful or blessed life that we all are after, and probably the reason that you're here, first of all, is to just accept what life is. That life, as Scott Peck said, is difficult, but it's an oscillation. It's going to be an up and a down. And that pattern is not going to change. And because it doesn't change, and because it starts at the earliest parts of our lives, it leaves an impression on us. And what is the overwhelming impression that these oscillations leave? Well, unfortunately, it's negative. And here's the key to that. Why would these ups and downs that we express and experience throughout our lives leave a negative impression on us most likely and most often? It's because the pain, the traumas, the difficulties require something from us that the pleasurable moments don't. The pain and the trauma requires a reaction to the pain. It requires a defense to be set up so that we can survive. Pleasure doesn't require that. You just want to sit in and you want more of it. But when you hit the difficult times, a defense response has to go in. And these defense responses that we build are sturdy. They don't just fall apart when the pain goes away. They remain in place, continuing. So we are much more shaped by the trauma, by the pain, by the difficult things that we have gone through than we are by the good things. I remember a movie line where someone says to the, uh, one character says to another, you know, you'll never believe what just happened. And the other one says, if it's bad news, I generally do believe it. Why would that be true? I mean, that's, isn't that all of us? Aren't we much more apt to believe bad news than good news? In fact, if the good news is too good, then it's just too good to be true and we don't believe it. We are so much more conditioned to the negative. We are so much more conditioned to accept the bad news. That's what we have to start to look at. We're shaped by these defenses. How in the world can we move past them? Think of your self-talk. Think of that voice in your head that's talking to you all the time, all day long. Studies show that people, on average, Half the time, 49% of the time, are not thinking about what they're doing at the moment. You move into uh, addiction and recovery communities, that number goes over 90%. Where are you at? How much of the time is that voice talking to you so that you are thinking about that and whatever it's presenting and not the moment that's at hand? There's an opportunity to create a downside that doesn't need to be. But now think about the quality of that talk. What's that voice saying? You know? 
Is it reminding you of all the laundry that you didn't get done? The bills that need to be paid? Maybe you left the door unlocked? You know, what about the kids? What are they doing? What about my husband? What about my wife? What about the job that I'm going to need to get? You know, am I ever, ever going to get ahead? Am I ever going to be able to do the things that I wanted to do? Look at that person. They got it all going on. I'm never going to be that good. What's that person thinking of me? Am I hitting a few of the places? I mean, this is what goes on in our head constantly. That kind of negative self-talk. Is there something that we can do about that? Is there something that we can do so that in this oscillation of life, we aren't adding to it on the negative side? That's what we'd want to try to do. Because make no mistake, the reality that you believe is the reality that you endure. The reality you believe is a reality you endure, regardless of what is being presented to you in the moment. What you believe, what gets through your filter, is what you're going to have to endure. And so our life has effectively taken the pendulum and pulled it way over to one side because of the difficulties that we've faced. If we are going to be able to move in the direction that Jesus is pointing us, we need a way to be able to pull that pendulum back. Not all the way to the positive side. That's not the point. You get over to the positive side, and now you're going to be Pollyanna. Now you're going to be in denial about what life really is. What we want to do is hit the balanced middle. But since it's so far over here, we're going to have to do a lot of counterbalancing just to be able to get it to center. And this is what we're talking about. This is what we need to do. There's a... One of these daily devotionals that uh, is used for one of the 12-step groups and ran across this uh, passage I wanted to read to you because it it just is right on with what we're saying. It's uh, October 5th. Sometimes I become so bogged down with dissatisfaction that I can't see where I am or where I'm going. When I take time to think, I realize that negativity keeps my life at a standstill. Now, while it's good to acknowledge whatever I feel, I have a choice about where to focus my attention. I'm challenged to find positive qualities in myself, my circumstances, and other human beings. As I attend meetings, list the things that I'm grateful for, and talk with others, these attributes become apparent if I'm willing to see them. I believe that I have a beautiful spirit that has been created for some purpose. The people and situations I encounter each day also have beauty and purpose. I can begin to look for the positive in everything I do and see. The perspective I've gained by doing so has shown me that some of the most difficult times in my life have produced the most wonderful changes. It may be difficult to break a long-established pattern of depression, doomsaying, and complaining, but it's worth the effort. I'll replace a negative attitude with a positive one today. Okay, so that is a little bit saccharine, a little bit like a Hallmark card, but it's still true. It may sound like, are you reading that? Oh, but you don't know my problems. You don't know what's going on in my life. And I get that. I get that. But even if it's a question of degree, it doesn't change the truth that we can make these choices. We can move in other directions. So, Let's get into the more real world. What does Paul have to say about the, this, this subject? Let's take a look. I'm going to look at Romans here. Romans 12, starting at verse 1. And it's in your uh, handouts. And if you have your handouts, get them out, because we're going to be looking at two different translations. And of course, uh, he's got them up there, I'm sure. Romans 12, starting at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren... By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, now given what we were just talking about, how helpful is that to you? (laughs) I don't know. It's not real helpful to me just off the top here reading this. In fact, it seems like it's just adding a bunch of more negatives. You know, sacrifice. Well, that's a four-letter word. Do I want to really want to sacrifice when I already feel like life is taking a bunch of stuff away from me? Don't conform, right? And perfect. Oh, prove. Look at all those words. 
Sacrifice, don't conform, prove, perfect. It just sounds like a lot more rules, a lot more work, and a lot more difficulty. But now I want to read the same passage to you in the message, which is Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Listen how he translates those phrases that give us so much trouble. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to break it down. So here's what I want you all to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Now look at that. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. That's the sacrifice that Paul is talking about, a living sacrifice It's every moment of your day. Every moment of your day, just doing what you normally do. But with God in mind, with an awareness of the connection in this present moment, transforms it into a sacred moment, transforms it into sacrifice. He says, embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. That's worship. That's what worship is all about. The worship that Jesus talks about you know, in spirit and in truth, is exactly that. Embracing God. Embracing what God does for us. Everything that God is about. That's worship. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. That's the renewal part, the renewing of the mind. Instead, fix your attention on God. The don't conform part. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That's the renewal part. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. That's what the proof is. It's not some difficult proof. It's just recognizing where God is, what his pleasure is, his will, his desire, his deepest purpose. Recognizing that in the moment, in ourselves, responding to it. What more proof do you need? This is stuff we can do. This is difficult, but it's simple. And it's not restrictive either. To live this way will be the most liberating thing that can happen if we look at it this way and see what's going on. So it's not so bad. It falls right in line with Brother Lawrence, one of my absolute heroes, and I know you've heard me talk about it. Brother Lawrence was that 16th century monk who realized that God was just as present in the kitchen where he worked as he was in the chapel or anywhere else. He made no distinction between any moment of the day in terms of his ability to connect with God's presence. And he said, you know, people think that we have to invent all these means to come at God, rituals and sacrifices and techniques and all this stuff. And he says, it's not so. Just do what you normally do all day long, but do it for the love of God. Translated, do it with God's presence in mind. Do it with that kind of attention to detail that makes it a sacred act, and it is a sacred act. It's exactly what Paul is talking about, what Brother Lawrence is trying to get across. We read a passage last Wednesday from Thomas Merton, and I just want to give you the highlights of it because hopefully it's going to Keep this point getting sunk in deeper and deeper. Burton writes, don't stir up useless interior activities. (laughs) Don't stir up useless interior activities. Don't do a bunch of stuff inside because you think you have to be busy about it or you think you have to have these artificial means at coming at God. He says, don't do that. Avoid unnecessary complications in your life. Ooh. Can we do that? Is that even possible? Can you tell what the unnecessary ones are from the necessary ones? You know, if you really pay attention, you can. Of all the things that you're dealing with, of all the things that complicate your life, how many of them really need to be there? How many of them really deserve your attention? 
And what could be jettisoned without even missing a beat? He says, don't go out of the way to get involved in labors and duties. Don't create a bunch of exterior work, just like you're not going to create a bunch of interior work. Just do the tasks that are appointed to you as perfectly as you can. And here's an interesting phrase. Do the tasks that are appointed to you as perfectly as you can with disinterested love. Now that sounds like a negative to us, but what's he talking about? He's talking about the kind of attention that is not focused on outcome. It's not focused on agenda. It's simply immersed in whatever task, whatever conversation, whatever relationship is at hand. Without that agenda, without that overthinking, just presence. And of course, he says, with peace. Do what you do quietly and without a fuss. This is beginning the process of renewing our mind. Paul, Lawrence, and Thomas are all saying the same thing to us in different ways. And with the help of Eugene, we can really lock it all together here. Try to understand what is going on here. Not a lot of extra stuff. It's just the stuff that you do. Done this way, done with this kind of attention, will start the process of pulling the pendulum back to center. We will find enjoyment in our moments. We will find connection in our moments. We will find God's presence in our moments that will start to undo all of the default programming from however many years you've been breathing on this planet. Grounding everything we do in a concrete presence. Now, can Jesus put a finer point on this? Yeah, I think he can. Let's take a look at Matthew 6, starting at verse 31. First, we're going to read it in the New American Standard Bible. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Love that line. So he's talking about worry. He's talking about dissatisfaction. He's talking about comparing us to others. He's talking about judgment. He's talking about all these things. He says, don't do them. These are the enemies of you building a complete presence and a connection in the moment in your life. We will conform to these obsessions, these worries, right? For as long as we are Gentiles, quote unquote. And this, this word Gentiles is so interesting. In the Greek, it's ethnos. In Aramaic, ama de alma. But what it is pointing to is a race or a tribe or a culture. It's a group of people who have the same habit, but in this case, foreign to us. In other words, these are people who don't know our ways. They have other ways. And most importantly, they don't know our God. What Jesus is saying is, as long as you don't know our God, as long as you don't know our Father, then you are going to be working in fear and living in fear and planning in fear. You are going to be obsessed about what you will wear and what you will eat because you don't understand the provision. You don't understand the absolute love that he represents in our lives. But if we seek God's kingdom first, then something happens. Something changes. How do we do this? Not real clear when you read it directly out of an English translation, but let's yet let Eugene come to our rescue again. Same passage from the message. Do not worry, vain. I'm sorry. What I'm trying to do here, <laughs> Jesus is saying, is to get you to relax. How great is that? I would have loved to have watched him making this paraphrase. Wouldn't that be, a, you know, of course it's all an interior process, but I'd love to have been inside his head as he's reading the Greek and he's reading the Hebrew and he's reading the Aramaic to make the choices that he made. He did such an amazing job. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep, in your, li steep your life in God reality. 
Steep your life in God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Steep your life in God reality. God initiative. God reality, being present. God initiative, doing the things that this moment actually requires. God provision, realizing we're not coming from a place of lack, but from a place of abundance, internally, spiritually. This is the renewing of the mind. And this will change us from generally believing the bad news to opening the possibility that the good news really does exist. And it exists right here and it exists right now. And if we will live this way, we will see the evidence of that good news everywhere we look. I want to sharpen the point just one more time. What Jesus is really saying to us here, one of the things he's saying, is that it's always today. It's always today. It's never tomorrow, it's never yesterday, it's today. And I know this is becoming a platitude, and you've heard it here a million times, and it may, might just be going over your head by now, that now is the only moment that exists. We know that. But are we really living as if that's true? Because if we were, it would be changing things. How about this? How about if we put it this way? Kingdom, as Jesus is talking about it, is not a permanent state it's not a this or a that. It's not one big thing that we enter and then we're there. You know? You go to the Colosseum, you're there. Big thing, one thing, permanent state, and then you leave. Or you... The kingdom is momentary. And what do I mean by that? The kingdom is momentary. Either we are steeping in God reality or we're not. Either in this moment we're steeping in God initiative and God provision, or we're not. Looking at the past gives us a misinterpretation, I think, of things. Because when we look at the past and we remember our lives, it looks like all one thing. You know, we see all of those moments as a whole. We see the path like flagstones in the lawn leading from our birth to this moment right now. And we see it as one thing. And then when we look at the future, we want to imagine the same thing exists, that the future is all one thing. It's a path that's all laid out, if nowhere else in God's mind. And we can enter it if we just do everything right. Kingdom is the same way. We see it as this thing that we can enter. If we just do it right, it's like a switch that we throw, and kingdom is on, and then it's going to stay on, and it's going to be permanent. But we know that life is oscillating. But more importantly, each moment is the choice to enter kingdom or not. We don't enter once and for all. This moment right now, you're here. Are you here? You're here. Are you taking advantage of everything that's available to you here? the words that are being spoken, the music that is played, the presence of all of these lovely people around you, God's Spirit permeating, enabling everything that is here. Are you aware of that? Are you here? Are you really here? This moment when you came into this room, did you choose kingdom? Because either you did or you didn't. Or you didn't and now you did, and then you didn't again. Every moment is a choice. And every moment that we realize that our Thoughts have wandered. We are no longer thinking about the thing that we're doing. Every moment that we realize we're depressed again, we're stressed again, we're worrying again, is the moment that we stepped out. But the beautiful thing is, we can step back in at any time we want. It's that simple and that difficult at the same time. Kingdom is momentary. A lifetime ago, when I was in jazz band in college, back in Chicago, we had a band director that, that was just remarkable. I still remember him to this day, his name, Paul Telasco. And uh, he was just a great guy. I, can, I, can, I was a second 
tenor sax. So I was in the front row looking right up at him, and I can still look up in my mind's eye and see his face and see him directing us. There was this one song, and it was called String of Pearls. It's the old Glenn Miller song. And we would always rush it. You know, it's, a, it's, it's very, you know the song. Da, 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 da. We would always rush through that because we weren't playing the rest. And so finally he stopped the whole band and had us put down our instruments, and he said, okay, I want you to imagine a long conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt is just moving ahead in front of you, all right? And there's going to be markings on this conveyor belt. And every time the marking comes by, you lay down the note. And then you wait till the next come marking comes by. Lay down the note. 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 But you got to wait for it. Note. Note. He was trying to give us a visual for playing the negative space, playing the rests, because we kept rushing through. Yeah. I don't know how well we did after that. I think maybe it got a little better, but that, that visual sticks with me because it was so perfect. I mean, if you don't like that one so much, then you can think about uh, Lucy and Ethel in the <laughs> candy factory. See, I know a lot of you already went there, didn't you? Yeah, you remember that one. For those of you who are too young, they're, they're, they're wrapping candies that come through a conveyor belt and they get all messed up and hopelessly behind because they're getting cocky about it at first because they're doing so well and then the belt speeds up and then they're worried about how fast they're coming out and where they're going and before you know it, they're stuffing them in their mouths and in their pockets. And Either way, this idea of playing the rests, not rushing through the negative space to get to the positive space because when we do that, we miss God. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is not one thing. It's like a string of pearls. From a distance, it'll look like a necklace, but you got to put each pearl on there yourself. With each choice you make for kingdom, you're putting a pearl on the string. And another, and another, and another. And eventually, you don't have a string anymore. You have a string of pearls. You'll be characterized by the pearls and not by the string. When you choose enough of those moments, it will characterize you. But make no mistake, the process never stops. It gets easier, just like the tightrope walker. But every moment you're choosing, am I here? Am I now? Am I grateful? Am I aware of everything that has been provided to me right now or not? And when you realize the answer is not, that you've chosen not kingdom, you come right back and choose kingdom and put another pearl on that string. This is what kingdom is like. Momentary. We don't just flip a switch and it stays on all the time. This is what we've got to try to understand. It comes down to just living each moment with the intention of seeing God within. And obviously, some moments are going to be easier than others, right? We know that. But playing those rests, playing that negative space, leaning in even to the moment that hurts is what is going to take us to that place Jesus is talking about. To give us the balanced pendulum in the center, riding the oscillations of life in such a way that more and more and more we can believe in the good news. We've been shaped by the bad news. We need to steep in the good news that's only available to us now, and now, and now. And if we need just a little bit more specifics, I'm going to go back to George. At the end of this little treatise on aging, he has several points of how to stay young. And he says, first of all, Throw out non-essential numbers. This includes age, weight, and height. <laughs> Let the doctors worry about those. That's why we're paying them. Keep only cheerful friends. The grouches pull you down. Keep learning. Learn more about the computer, crafts, gardening, whatever. Even ham radio. Never let the brain idle. The idle mind is a devil's workshop, and the devil's family name is Alzheimer's. Enjoy the simple things. Laugh often, long, and loud. Laugh until you gasp for breath. The tears happen. Endure, grieve, and move on. The only person who is with us our entire life is ourselves. Be alive while you are alive. Surround yourself with what you love, whether it's family, pets, 
keepsake, music, plants, hobbies, whatever. Your home is your refuge. Cherish your health. If it's good, preserve it. If it's unstable, improve it. If it's beyond what you can improve, get help. And don't take guilt trips. Take a trip to the mall, even to the next county, to a foreign country, but not to where the guilt is. Tell the people you love that you love them at every opportunity. And always remember, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. And finally, if you don't send this to at least eight people, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Let's pray. Oh. oh, Father, thank you for George and everyone who makes us laugh. We need to laugh more. <sighs> thank you for our pets. Thank you for our children. Thank you for clouds in the sky. Thank you for anything that can draw us out of ourselves, out of our heads, and focus us, fasten us to this moment, this spot on the conveyor belt that will take us for a ride. Father, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've given us and everything that you keep giving us. Help us to take one thing away from this morning that we can use that we can land on, that we can grab onto, that will bring us home here in you right now with each other. So that each day we're pushing the ball forward toward a more and more perfect residency in your kingdom. Thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us. Never let us forget we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.